Next, I'm so pleased to introduce the Honourable Gabrielle Williams, Minister for Mental Health, Minister for Ambulance Services, and Minister for Treaty and First Peoples. She's proudly represented her local community as the member for Dandenong in the Victorian Parliament since 2014. Minister, it means a lot to us that you can be here today as we gather in Melbourne. Welcome. Thanks, Naomi, for that very warm welcome, and uh, thank you also, former President Modlante, for a wonderful address um, and a very inspiring one. It's, it's such a pleasure to be able to share a stage with you. Before I begin, please let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're currently gathered, the Wurundjeri people, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present and any other elders we may have here with us today, and to say those words not out of habit but to reflect on the journey that we're on here in Victoria towards truth-telling and treaty, and now the national journey that we are on here in Australia uh, towards a voice, a constitutional recognition of our First Peoples, many, many, many years too late, but so very important to achieving better outcomes for our First Nations people now and into the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, I also want to acknowledge and welcome uh, the many of you here today with lived or, or living experience of substance use, as well as your, your families and your supporters and commend you on your advocacy. I always uh, reflect on the fact that it's such a profound act of generosity to share your own stories and your own experiences, many of which will be negative experiences, so that you can ultimately improve the lives of others and ensure that others don't have those negative experiences. It is. Um, not only a profound act of generosity, but it is also one of the most meaningful acts of public service um, any person um, can give. And I also want to acknowledge that I know for, for many in our community that process comes at a cost. Um, it can be, uh, and it can involve reliving personal trauma um, all for the greater good. So I wanted to spend some time acknowledging that. And I also, I guess um, to acknowledge in that the impact of, of stigma and discrimination and how much a part of, of so many of your stories that will be, and hopefully I'll have a, a chance to uh, talk to that shortly. I also, of course, want to honour and recognise uh, our former president, as, I, as I've acknowledged earlier, and of course, Her Excellency Ms. Gugu Modlante as well, who I had a great discussion with uh, before uh, coming onto stage earlier. Um, I know we also had former Prime Minister Helen Clark here throughout the conference, which um, somebody who I am uh, a, a huge fan of, um, what a powerhouse um, she is, so very pleased to, to see that she was a part of this conference as well. And my fellow speakers here with us today, uh, Paul Hunt and Judy Chang, such a pleasure to be able to meet you both um, here today, and other dignitaries who have been uh, in and out of uh, this conference over the last few days and sharing their wisdom with us. Um, I feel like I should also acknowledge the two people who constituted my um, cheer squad upon my <laughs> announcement earlier, uh, earlier, uh, what, about half an hour ago, which is, of course, uh, Fiona Patton, who is down here as a, a former mem member of the Legislative Council in the Victorian Parliament and someone who will be known to many of our, our local delegates here, um, and Judy Ryan, who has long been uh, an advocate, um, especially for our medically supervised injecting room here, here in North Richmond, and I know many of you have, have been out to see that. I also want to extend my welcome and thanks to Victoria's talented and thoughtful leaders in harm reduction, including Sione Crawford uh, and the wonderful team at Harm Reduction Victoria. Um, it is challenging work. It is challenging work. Uh, it is often in a difficult context. These are conversations uh, that you're driving that aren't always easily had and, and the doors aren't always open to you. Um, but uh, I'm very grateful uh, for your perspective and, and your wisdom and, and your generosity, uh, particularly for me being uh, fairly new to this role uh, in sharing that with me, so thank you. It's testament to your expertise and, and hard work that so many leaders, I think, in this field have come from around the world uh, to Melbourne to participate in this conference. I think that says a lot about the importance of the discussions that have taken place here. Uh, and also says a lot about your individual and collective contributions uh, to, to these issues. Uh, so thank you again. Look, it's such a, a pleasure to be able to be here, um, albeit on a fairly tight time frame, so I do, if I do have to disappear quickly after this, I apologise. 
But to be here for the closing of what has clearly been such a vibrant conference, the program shows such an astounding breadth and thought leadership, policy debate, and something very close to my heart, compassion. What is most apparent to me about the harm reduction community, whether that be uh, you know, ordinary people, practitioners, advocates, policy makers, academics in, the, in these fields, is the deep and abiding commitment to fairness, to justice, and as a conference theme explores, to collaboration. And I'm sure many of you here today have reflected on whether governments can truly ever be a collaborative partner with the harm reduction community, uh, but I'm here to say that I believe we can. The context of drug criminalisation certainly makes for difficult conversations. I want to acknowledge that at the outset, but I'm sure that you'll agree that difficult conversations are the ones that really do create meaningful change. Uh, I was elected to the Victorian Parliament in 2014, and in, in the not too far off 10 years since, uh, I've seen the community and the government wrestle with some really difficult conversations and issues, both inside and outside of the Parliament, uh, and which have led to some big changes and some small changes, and I'm sure with more to come. And one of the big changes that's taken place here in Victoria has been the establishment of the medically supervised injecting room. And a recent independent review of that injecting service, chaired by John Ryan, found that since its establishment in 2018, uh, that service has succeeded in achieving the trial's central objectives, which is to save lives. And that to that end, there have been more than 6,000 overdose events safely managed which means a projected 63 lives saved uh, on those numbers. But more than that, uh, a lot of people, um, far more than 6,000, connected to uh, the services that they need, not always directly related um, to their drug use, sometimes uh, things as simple as dental services, health checks, things that we all need uh, to maintain healthy lives um, and, uh, and to feel better in and of ourselves. The Victorian Labor government has committed to making this service permanent now. It was initially on a trial basis, and we currently have a bill before Victoria's parliament to enact and embed that change. I had the pleasure of visiting the facility yesterday morning and met with the amazing team from North Richmond Community Health who deliver uh, that service. And I know many of you here in the room uh, in the last couple of days have taken the opportunity to tour that facility. Uh, and I hope it's provided you with uh, food for thought. And uh, I was reflecting earlier that uh, you know education goes both ways. So while it might have given you some, of, uh, you some of you ideas to take back to your home countries, I'm sure you've got some feedback um, for us as well uh, in how things um, could be done better. And that exchange, I believe, is also really important. I also want to reflect on some of the seemingly smaller but hard-won changes to the law relating to uh, peer distribution of needles and syringes and naloxone. Uh, Victoria's take-home naloxone program will commence in, in coming months and it will enable needle and syringe programs to distribute naloxone alongside other NSP supplies as well as the provision of, of free naloxone from pharmacies. So legislative change here in 2022, thank you. Legislative change also enshrined the right of peers to distribute naloxone in their communities. And I don't think we can underestimate the impact of that change. This will save lives, it will give more Victorians a chance to recover from addiction. Uh, and this was a policy success truly di driven by, uh, by our lived experience community, recognising uh, the, the tireless work here of Jane Dicker of Harm Reduction Victoria uh, with collaboration. <laughs> well done. with collaboration and support of local advocates like John Ryan and academics like uh, Paul Ditzer. Uh, they work extensively with government to enact uh, changes like these, and I want to thank them uh, and many others like them uh, for your steadfast advocacy. I also want to highlight that lived experience has been uh, core not just to changes here around uh, drug policy, but also uh, instrumental, an instrumental voice for harm reduction uh, through the Sex Work Decriminalisation Act uh, 2022, which is un un underpinned by a very simple proposition, which is that sex work is work. And this important piece of legislation, and it's very, very lovely to have Fiona Patton in the room to hear this, somebody who was also instrumental in this change, but this important piece of legislation seeks to destigmatise sex work and give sex workers the same rights and protections as any other Victorian worker. It means that sex workers <laughs> in Victoria will no longer be forced to make what is an absolutely impossible choice between working legally or keeping themselves safe. 
uh, and I'm so pleased that people no longer have to make that decision. Point taken. I'd like to recognise both the National Peak Sex Worker Organisation, the Scarlet Alliance, the Victorian Peer Organisation, Vixen, uh, for their ongoing advocacy, and also the Sex Work Law Reform Committee, just a few of the voices that were part of um, those changes. And similarly, uh, across the world, drug policy is at a time of transformative change, I think, as this conference um, represents change and reform, and in Victoria we're determined to ensure that we have lived and living experience at the heart of that work. In recent years, one of the hallmarks of the transformation underway in the alcohol and other drugs portfolio, uh, which I have the pleasure of holding, is, is the emphasis on our health-led approach to drug and alcohol use, and I know the President uh, mentioned uh, the importance of, of health approaches as well. To me, health-led approaches mean embracing the solutions that empower people and take care, uh, to take care of themselves and others, supported by, the, by good service delivery, of course, and, and a wider community. But it's also about destigmatisation, about destigmatising these issues. And I, I'm often given cause to reflect on the fact that stigma is such a wicked, wicked barrier to progress. Uh, and we've got to do something about that, and it's incumbent upon people like me um, to be involved in that process in partnership with all of you. It's impossible to truly serve someone's needs without collaborating with them on what support means for them at that time uh, or place and in that context uh, that they are in, of their families as well and their communities that, uh, that they're a part of. A health-led approach is inherently collaborative. So where do we see this health-led approach uh, health led approach in the policies of the Victorian government today. Well, uh, last year the Victorian Labor government invested uh, about $313 million in AOD services, including responding to global supply pressures for critical harm reduction products. And today the Andrews Labor government, um, uh, people with lived and living experience, service providers, workforces and the community at large are, are working together to roll out health led support for people who are uh, intoxicated in public so that we can repeal the outdated astonishingly outdated public drunkenness offence. Now, by accepting the challenge of a health-led approach, we must make a commitment to doing uh, better at a systems level and responding to people's needs and respecting their choices. Uh, finally, over the past few months, I've heard Victoria's AOD sector talk a lot about the challenge uh, in or challenges, there's, there's several of them in the opioid pharmacotherapy treatment system, both locally and nationally. And we are, of course, uh, privileged to have the leadership of Harm Reduction Victoria, both as an advocate and um, for the delivery of the pharmacotherapy advocacy and medication service phone line, better known as PAMS. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to recognise the incredible work of, of PAMS, of the PAMS team who undertake very tough and complex work connecting those who want access um, to opioid treatment uh, with prescribers and pharmacists, which is not always easy work. So thank you to the PAMS team for making such a huge difference in people's lives. And, and to that end also, thank you to those prescribers and dispensers who are performing um, such vital work. We know that there is a lot more work to do, and we know that there are challenges that we must confront to get a better outcomes in this area. So look, over coming months, I hope to talk to Victoria's harm reduction community and, uh, of course, the AOD sector about what needs to be done over the longer term to get more focus on this sector uh, in order to drive uh, better outcomes for those who depend on it. Um, earlier, I acknowledged that it can be difficult for people with a lived and living experience of drug use to collaborate um, with government. We do want to hear more from you, uh, we, and, and quite frankly, policymakers uh, like me and, and many others like me need to need to enter in the, into those discussions uh, in earnest uh, and, and make sure that we are listening to those views and to those ideas that I know um, are in vast supply uh, among you all. Look, as a community, we achieve nothing without collaboration and without these difficult conversations, and I know I keep emphasising that they are difficult because they are, uh, and it's, it, you know, part of being able to overcome that is addressing it from the outset and, and coming to these discussions with open hearts and open minds. So thank you again for the opportunity to join you all um, this afternoon and for your continued work and advocacy across uh, global harm uh, reduction. It's been such uh, a delight to be able to join you, but also so wonderful to see uh, such a vibrant com conversation happening right here uh, in Victoria, uh, where I hope it will spark many, many more conversations and hopefully some great partnerships into the future.
Thank you, Minister, for that important message about peer workforce and peer collaboration and peer leadership.